Hello and welcome back to the Cosm Podcast. In this episode, I sit down with Alex Gray to explore a perennial issue in philosophy, as well as one of the core themes of his work, connecting science and religion. Why is there a seeming tension between the scientific and religious viewpoints, and how can we reconcile them to come to a fuller understanding of reality? Let's get right into this episode with Alex Gray. This tension between the scientific and religious viewpoints is something I was very sensitive to when I was in university, studying evolutionary psychology and religion. Religion seemed to deny the reality of evolution, to deny that humans are a branch of the tree of life, that we are, as Jared Diamond would say, the third chimpanzee. I had come to the understanding that, from a scientific perspective, evolution is one of the truest ideas we have. For this reason, I knew religion as a way of understanding the world could be flawed. But though much of religion denies evolution, which is a problem, science seems to deny the soul, which is also a big problem. The materialist, objective viewpoint that the scientific method demands can leave little room for the subjective experience of the divine. And this is when I came upon your work. Your art was the first time that I had ever seen the effort to bring the reality of evolution into a religious framework. Or perhaps, rather, you brought religion into an evolutionary framework, quite literally, as each of the sacred mirrors is in a frame that outlines the evolutionary process. It was the first time I had ever witnessed evolution acknowledged in a theological setting. So that made it very clear to me that you've thought deeply about the value of both science and religion and what they can bring to the table and have made a very concerted effort to integrate them both into your art and worldview. So what do you make of this seemingly perennial conflict between science and religion and how and why have you tried to reconcile them in your art? Hmm. Well, I think that both fields are fields of inquiry about the nature of reality and the discovery of truth, ultimately, I think is what both of those uh, pursuits that it would, you know, lead one in the spiritual direction they're leading. They're looking for an ultimate reality. They're searching for, as most of the mystics have affirmed, a very discoverable reality affirmed by mystics over millennia, actually, which lends a credibility cross-culturally, just like science, to a body of wisdom that's been referred to as perennial philosophy and things like that, some of the mystic insights of unity, some of which have recently been cataloged by the psychedelic scientists who are looking at the mystical experience as a catalyst to healing. Psychedelic science I think places us right at that crux of science and religion, that our inquiry into the self and inquiry into the nature of reality, one affirms an inner truth that can be affirmed simply by looking inside and with the right kind of questions that one uh, digs for and tries to answer to the best of one's ability, you can wind up in God territory, you know. And I I like to say that uh, DMT is the banana peel on the doorstep of materialism because uh, once you've smoked DMT, if you thought that you understood what consciousness was, I think uh, you'll have a few questions Mm -hmm. after that. And... Uh, So, psychedelic science, because of its uh, unique position and because of the kinds of questions that come up around the taking of psychedelics, questions that are basic philosophical questions that lead us in the territory of religion, 
and and lead us into the territory of of wondering the ultimate realities and essentially the kind of questions that we need to know existentially in order to feel like we have reason to live. I became interested in these um, the confluence of these fields once I understood the religion. Really, uh, to say religion is to, is to uh, have an v- extremely wide-ranging kind mm-hmm. of word, you know, and, and means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So we, uh, I'm always kind of careful with these generalities and yeah. things like that. And there's, because also we have to say, uh, for the reasons that you put forward, that at a time when the dominant paradigm of truth and reality is a scientific framework, that the religious framework uh, seems to uh, be a backward and uh, kind of dependent on myths, mm-hmm. you know, and instead of what we like to uh, think of as truths. Mm-hmm. Now, my interest in religion and in uh, mysticism is because of the uh, likeness that the perennial wisdom has to the discoveries that you make in the classic psychedelic experience. And uh, because this is, I believe, is an evolutionary psychological uh, phenomenon, and that this seems to be the nature of reality is that, and any artist can uh, affirm, or anybody who's done a creative thing over a period of years, can affirm that there is an evolutionary process simply in the act of making art. Mm -hmm. One thing builds on the other. You discover and then you go off on branches and each one has little children of ideas, you know, that are fruiting off of those branches, you know. Mm-hmm. And so uh, to live a life in uh, cre- any creative medium, I believe, is to discover evolution in, you know, in process, you know, in, in your own flow yeah. uh, in general. You know, like Ken Wilber likes to make the connection between creativity and evolution you know it's kind of like creativity is evolution in your hands Mm -hmm. and so because I place such a high um, uh, regard on creativity uh, I see that as well as the uh, mysticism that runs through all the different world religions I see that creativity as one of those other uh, elements that run through all the world religions and give us a sense of the soul, give us a sense of the sacred. And that's that's the territory of religion, to point to God, to point to spirit, to point to primordial awareness or Buddha nature or, you know, whatever name you want to give to the g- ultimate mystery uh, that is and uh, that we're all, you know, the the fruit and and uh, children of basically, you know, mm-hmm. as a, and I think the evolutionary froth basically, you know, we're the, uh, as many people have commented, the way that the the cosmos has of observing and and uh, reflecting on itself and becoming conscious. I think the point you've made of like, we need to be very careful on how we define these terms. Mm -hmm. I think that's very important because a lot of people, when they hear religion, and I was guilty of this many years ago, you just kind of think of religion as a collection of superstitions, right? like a superstitious thought, people who are just kind of naive of reality and belie- yeah. and, and it's, it's make believe, right. but I think we're all past that now, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. I think what you're saying is no religion is not just a collection of superstitions. Religion is actually almost a, a, a very carefully created map of, consciousness or at least some kind of a record 
from what different cultures have of entering these realms yeah. and trying to bring them into resolution. I think that this is uh, why you see so many, um, you know, just look at what happened to Richard Alpert, for example. <laughs> like you get this kind of buttoned up Harvard intellectual, then he starts doing scientist. Sci scientist, yeah, yeah, scientist. And then he does psychedelics. And what happens after that? He falls back into a religious framework because it helps him understand this new realm of consciousness that he's entered into. Well, let's look at what is a religious framework. Religion, you know, mm. the, the word itself, uh, re is again, and ligare has to do with tying. Mm -hmm. So the idea is to tie oneself back to God. Mm. Uh, how do we do that it's the mystical experience that ties one to the divine mm -hmm. that erases basically the space between your ego self and the divine you know you meet the infinite and dissolve into it for a, for a while and in the psychedelic experience and people who, who are atheists and myself i was a agnostic atheist kind of uh, character that had given up on God, basically, you know, and uh, at the age of 21, I guess, and uh, and before that, really, and had things had grown very dark. I was ready to call it quits, you know, at the age of 21. So uh, um, for some reason, I needed God. I needed an affirmation that there was a transcendent dimension in reality that was way beyond my comprehension and that I was really, if, if I could get right and align myself with the flow and the energy that it was, this is cosmic creativity itself. This is evolutionary flow uh, as creativity. You know, what else is it? What else could it be? You know, mm. it's, if it's like the breaking wave of now, and you can choose uh, to make any picture you want as an, say, just as an artist, you know. This is, you know, the the options are, just seem infinite, even though they're, you know, they're very defined, but but for the imagination, it's infinite. Yeah. And, and uh, so, um, so as I was saying, my approach to both fields, science and religion is through the lens of art, mm -hmm. you know, that, that uh, both are symbolic uh, to me. And this is why uh, the presentation of, of the two in juxtaposition with each other resolves the polarity <laughs> without really resolving it. You know, here's the physical body and here's the spiritual body. Yeah. They both exist. You know, you affirm both dimensions. You place them on the same playing field, really, the, sa the same level of reality. And I think art, it's really great that you mentioned that art really is something that is common between science and religion, because in your work, you've brought in this um, uh, anatomical illustration is very much so a, a scientific tradition, it seems. Absolutely. Uh, so, it, and many scientists, before there were photographs, you did field drawings um, yeah. of, of your observations. Absolutely. And That's what science uh, was... Uh, you know, scientific illustration yeah. was certainly an art. And it was the way science was done, you know. The theory of evolution comes about because of drawing, yeah. not because of photographs. Mm -hmm. It becomes through because Darwin noticed things and had them drawn. Mm -hmm. Careful you know, observation. Careful observation and drawing. Now, mm -hmm. this is the, the direct line, and, and Leonardo was right there starting to draw that line of observation the careful observation of nature why isn't that a spiritual uh practice i believe it is you know and that science gives us the truths that we can measure these are the things that can be observed and agreed upon. Why is that not just a catalog of God's creation? Mm -hmm. You know, to me, that, that is the best and most granular catalog of uh, the cosmic masterpiece. You know, it's like, thanks, science, for paying such grand attention 
and to the to the detail yeah. and the fineness of wow. the of the intelligence that the universe was created with mm -hmm. you know it's only by trying to get rational and trying to see the laws behind the seeming chaos the buzz and confusion of reality that science could gain a grip and it took those genius mathematicians to start to come up with those theorems and things and to start to see the rotations of planets and and to start to conceive of our of our true place in the mm -hmm. universe you know now to my mind we have a much huger and more infinite cosmos than any religion ever conceived of from science from science yeah now Pardon me, but infinity is one of the greatest transcendental kind of uh, loops to be. <laughs> yeah. You know, the grander and broader and huger and uh, more inconceivably vast a thing becomes, the more uh, staggeringly, transcendentally magnificent to my uh, heart because every time that universe grows that much huger and uh, you know I, I mean uh, we've heard such things as the observable universe which just grew to its largest you know capacity we've seen to the edge of the big bang or something like that for of, of our uh, her, you know visibility plane it's the universe is much larger than that. Mm -hmm. There's uh, at least 30 times larger uh, than we can see. Yeah. And not only that, like <laughs> what we get from physics to multiverse theory. Yes. So the, our universe could be uh, almost like a bubble inside of a larger universe, which could be inside of a larger universe. And it could just be fractally infinite too. Right. So it's like, and, and it seems like both science and religion are motivated by this quest for truth yes. and a quest to have a relationship with the mystery of being. Totally. And I think it's important you know, to know what Albert Einstein said about this, where he said, we thus arrive at a conception of the relation of science to religion very different from the usual one. I maintain that the cosmic religious feeling is the strongest and noblest motive for scientific research. So what he says there is that that religious feeling, the wonder, the yeah. amazement is actually what motivates the, the scientific enterprise. That's what I was talking about. That yeah. You're cataloging the mysteries and you, you know, what's capable of being measured as nature is observable and catalogable and things like that. What a, what a quest. That's more the paying attention. You know, God created a universe and then we didn't pay attention. You know, wh what? You know, it's like God is looking at us saying, I gave you a universe, you know, just study it. Yeah. Just look at it a little, yeah. you know, and you'll start seeing some uh, patterns start observing the patterns and so uh you know for me at this point if if religion hasn't adopted science as uh a uh and is still arguing with uh basic science and things like that it's not serving the quote evolution of consciousness yeah. now okay these are admitted kind of reality frameworks and all of it is as ken wilber says everybody's correct everybody's got a piece of uh, the reality pie you know we we're somehow fitting it all together and i think that an integral approach uh would kind of demand the the an open eye in both worlds science measures the outer world everything that can be measured the mystic measures the inner world mm. and the psychedelic visionary artists 
are cataloging some of those dimensions. And this is why we get this overlap of the, uh, you know, religious, scientific, and, uh, you know, kind of artistic. Uh, I love that Mm -hmm. uh, overlap. Uh, And that's what we're particularly interested in because I'm interested in all of these ideas leading to consciousness transformation or, quote, evolution of oneself on the spiritual path Uh, because I think that both can serve that there were great scientists like Einstein you're mentioning and practically many of them Niels Bohr many of these uh, great physicists were also mystics uh, inside but they didn't confuse the dimensions they didn't collapse them one into the other you know one remains this inner world where of the mystic and the transcendental infinitudes and uh this is not some place you can put a camera it's not some place where you can stick your ruler put it on a scale no this is the domain of art and beauty and this is why symbolism and all the uh the rich domains that have been described by the arts and by you know the alchemists and all those uh sun psychologists and things that are mapping the domains and dimensions of consciousness i this is this is consciousness science Mm -hmm. i think religion is part of uh, is serving part of that framework yeah. the mythic stories are great psychological archetypes they're the crystallizations of cultural archetypes that have been able to benefit the spiritual growth and continuity of a culture you know to keep a culture alive and there, and to keep a contact with this transcendental domain through the symbolism mm. is actually a high functioning thing. And if you yeah. go to see the temples, you know that this this is not a stupid thing. These aren't this, naive, fantasizing no. people. These uh, this is the quintessence of human wisdom mm. that acknowledges both the truth and reality of the hard. Uh, you know, bricks and mortar reality that builds a temple and also, uh, and you got to get good with your science to have it last for thousands of years, yeah. actually. Yeah. You know, uh, and so, uh, and also a direct contact with a realm of the divine. Mm. I think that we have a unique kind of uh, time now where many people have become disaffected of traditional religion and they're but still have the itch and the yearning to make contact with the realm of the divine and maybe community actually that is also familiar with a similar kind of uh, contact with the divine or mystic reality and I, so I think these things that religion has carried forward for thousands of years uh, still has a valid function for humanity. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's just that perhaps some of the traditions, for some of the traditional reasons, uh, have not perhaps to some been as, as useful today. Yeah. Yeah, I think with religion, it's important to kind of separate what is what are those gems? What is of value? What are those lasting truths? And what might be kind of antiquated views and and theories of of reality that that might kind of give way to new observations. Um, And I think psychedelics, it it really broke the matrix in terms of our the scientific worldview. Because now what we have is a material way of studying the immaterial. You know, mm-hmm. psychedelics, you can, you can measure those. What's the dose, doc? You know, and, and it, so it brings, this, it brings this measurability into something that most people often considered immeasurable. And then there's this sentiment from a lot of scientists where if it can't be measured, it's not worth studying. Right. Um, and I think that's kind of the scientific, kind of the air of, of a lot of scientific thought is this 
uh, explaining away of things or, or kind of this over skeptical attitude that that pushes everything to the side that can't be measured well ever the measuring the immeasurable has actually been the business of science mm. you know how do we put a yardstick on that that's that's the creativity that's what you got to figure yeah, out you yeah. know and that's what like walter pankey was able to do uh when he started the good friday experiment you know he finally came up with a questionnaire that had the <clears throat> basic questions uh that would lead to answers about uh did you have a mystical experience mm -hmm. of course First, we have to define our terms. What is a mystical experience? So he had to put down in scientific terms and come to reality, you know, material world realities about what is the nature of this immeasurable experience? Mm -hmm. How do we measure it? So he was the first to break that yeah. immeasurability of the mystical, religious, spiritual experience as a psychedelic phenomenon yeah. we all you know for millennia we've known that it's true and from the you know from el usus to uh you know soma and the uh, great uh, vedic mysteries mm -hmm. you know we have uh, civilizations founded on psychedelics and uh and they built great temples and they had great visions and great mythic uh uh, you know, kinds of stories. Mm -hmm. Now, these visions and stories of the mythic gods and goddesses can go into a, not a fundamentalist framework, but more like the dream of a world culture. Mm -hmm. The beautiful dream of a world culture can be placed alongside of other dreams of world cultures in the great world religions. And we see what tremendous creative expression it's been and uh and kind of culture defining uh you know in the temple building and in the religious mythology and things you know we under we we measure ourselves by those spiritual heroes and things and gain inspiration uh by their moral example and things and so uh i think that that's the realm that science uh, is hard to get to. Mm -hmm. We're at a, I have to say, another um, kind of <sighs> critical point that you feel like could call together the forces of religion and science. Mm -hmm. For whatever the religious still has in terms of affiliation, and there are billions of people who are affiliated with a religious tradition and feel very uh, uh, uplifted, actually, uh, as well. Um, the opportunity that we see before us is, uh, now the scientists have presented before us the idea of climate change and that we're in a countdown um, with uh, the apocalypse if we don't uh, act and so as a world do we decide yes to life and no to some of the uh, means of production and various other difficult questions these are really difficult questions they're religious and scientific but mostly moral mm. questions that uh, the uh, human have to address in the very rapidly, you know, and uh, so the leadership of all great uh, uh, people in all of those fields, I think, is called for, and the greatest wisdom, you know, c to be put to task, uh, so that we can save the great masterpiece that I think is a spiritual, uh, you know, efflorescence in a mostly empty cosmos. Mm -hmm. Uh, that we should do everything we can to <laughs> save as much uh, as we can, yeah. you know, and need the forces of both religion and science to do so. Yeah, and I think what you're saying, the desire to save the earth, I think is 
like a religious viewpoint. Yes. Because one it's of, a sacred earth. It's a sacred earth. And d- stop defiling it. Yeah. Stop desacralizing the sacred. Yeah. You know, we ha- but we have to see it as sacred, something that we love. Something that is our our uh, the birthright of our children's children's children, you know, should be. Yeah. And uh, so that kind of moral framework. What kind of technology can we develop in the face of that uh, morality? And any kind of technology that we create has to serve the impulse to save the earth. Yes. Um, and, and I think this comes to another difference between science or and... Or save the life web. The earth is going to be fine, yeah, as exactly. we all know, and the lower fungi and things like that. Yeah. It's more like the higher yeah. ups that are going to suffer. Yeah. And, and But so here's the thing, though. Science can give us facts but it can't really give us ethics. Yes. The philosopher, the Enlightenment philosopher, philosopher David Hume said, it's hard to derive an ought from an is. And science can give us a laundry list of facts, but it can't really tell us how to act. It can tell us all these things about the earth, but to say the earth should be saved Science really can't tell us that because it, from a scientific nihilistic viewpoint, you could just say, ah, let it all burn anyway. And you could maintain a completely scientific rationale from that perspective. But that's a moral. Uh, if, you see, if you see someone, you know, who needs help and you can help. Yeah. And you don't. Yeah. Is that a moral decision? You know, and and so, you know, we're kind of in that position, you know, where as passengers on a ship, we're seeing the iceberg and trying to wake up the captains, you know, to steer us away a bit, please. And I think it's from religion, uh, from all these religious truths. I think religion is evolved knowledge about action what is the best way to live in the world what are the values we should be acting out of just look at the ten commandments like and um you know the buddhist eight is it the eightfold noble path you know so so if you see all that a lot of these religions they come with ways of acting morality and values and ways of approaching the world it seems like science can't give us it, science can give us what is, yes. but it can't give us what we should do. Exactly. It's up to the. It's up for the religious substructures to give us the values to act in light of the facts that science yes. gives us. Exactly, exactly. That's that's our condition and position, and because of the moral abdication, basically, of of corporate culture and that America is a corporate culture, you know, bent on material success. Uh, there hasn't been as much scrutiny, I think in the boardroom about decisions that might affect the future. And And this, this might be part of what Nietzsche was talking about when he, you know, proclaimed the death of God, you know, uh, God is dead and we have killed him. How will we wash the blood off of our hands? This idea is like when you take God out of the society, what's left is there's no nihilism. moral judge. It's it, nihilism. You know, yeah. And, and so the, the idea that there is a moral judge or that there is a, uh, hey, I should have done that, you know, that would have been the quote better thing to do. And so ultimately, what Schweitzer, uh, Albert Schweitzer, a great, uh, great physician and, and altru- altruist, um, he said, uh, what is the essence of ethics? It's reverence for life. Mm-hmm. Reverence for life. And um, so you have to have a religious experience in a, in a way or a spiritual experience to have reverence and to have a sense of the sacred yeah. and uh, so that's the domain that's of of religion and why uh, to tie oneself back to the divine or mm-hmm. to reverence 
uh, is meaningful, no matter what context, uh, you know, what flavor you uh, go for. You know, it's it's that experience of human contact with something beyond and ultimately mysterious and a source and a source of whatever is good, true, and beautiful on this, uh, in this strange dimension, you yeah. know, of Earth. Yeah, and that is a, it's a proclamation that being is preferable to non-being, you know, and I, I think that's that's a religious claim that it, it's it's better to be alive than not alive. I, yes. I think that's that's the claim when you made reverence that switch. For life. Reverence for life, right? Yes. Um, and you know, sometimes you hear these currents of atheism that point out, oh, you know, humanity is just a cancer on the earth and be, it'd be better if we just weren't here. You hear people say, even if all life just poofed away, it wouldn't matter. Everything's ultimately meaningless. We're just on a speck of sand in the middle of an infinite universe and everything we do is ultimately inconsequential and meaningless. It's like, what what do you make of the... of the so- so-called new atheism. Like sometimes you get these claims from the Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins types that, sure. that are very kind of um, dismissive of religion and dismissive of meaning from these shared cultural systems that were very kind of carefully mapped out and developed over thousands of years. Right. It's almost like, you know, sometimes when I hear these views, I get the vision of like, a 13-year-old boy swinging a baseball bat into an intricate, beautiful, stained-glass rose window. You know, that this, this destruction of this, of this fragile and, and, and beautiful thing without much thought of what will replace it. Right, right. Well, true. If there's a, a kind of sad result, of atheism you know it's the stridency i guess in a in it but the i just think uh you know everybody uh, should be able to have their view and i think that it's really actually beautiful and desirable that god would create a universe where there would be you know, people who could conceive of God, but then to conceive of the complete absurdity of God, you know, and so, (laughs) so that, that, uh, that it's much more fun to have, uh, beings that don't even believe you exist, you know, that, that you've given the capacity to understand that, that, uh, they're one with the infinite, you know, and so, it depends for some people though simply how you what what name you put on god you know they've thought of god as this well of course it's the bearded chap that michelangelo drew you know that's yeah. what we're talking about that man in, man the, sky. in the sky I, I do not believe in that and i say well uh, applause applause oh my goodness you don't well <laughs> good for you you know it's like how absurd, you know, yeah. as a whole idea, or to think that there are that many people who would ever see that, or to to say that here's a symbol, he was speaking in archetypes, you know, and uh, the that religion speaks to us in uh, symbols like, mm-hmm. and archetypes, and really archetypes are right where meaning for the psyche, you know, I don't know what happens to these people at night when they dream, you know, they (laughs) just don't, oh, well, I'm not going to talk about that dream, you know, but, or here, um, you know, have a pipe full of DMT or better yet, uh, a few LSD sessions at various dosages and just to investigate all the full range of what consciousness is and then come back uh, in the morning and say, yeah. do you believe, uh, h- how are you feeling about this uh, spirituality thing? You know, whatever term you give to it, you know, to s- once one has slipped into the infinite, it's pretty unforgettable. And it's also, 
you know, you have pause about certainty about uh, so many things and you have more openness, you know, mm. to the possibilities uh, that, you know, may not have been apparent, that you may not know everything and that yeah. your rationality may not give you access to simply all uh, realms of knowledge. Yeah, I, I think a lot of kind of the new atheist movement doesn't take the psychedelic experience seriously enough. It's a fully measurable uh, material yeah. uh, thing. And I think that as the brain science uh, comes out, you know, whatever philosophical questions, we can st we're still going to have them. You know, we still don't understand how a molecule in a neuron winds up giving you a vision. Mm -hmm. We don't understand that. Yeah. We don't understand what DMT is doing in the brain. It's there in as much proportion as serotonin and dopamine and all everything like that. It's got to be a neurotransmitter. It yeah. probably has to do with vision. Yeah. And, and, you know, science can tell us so much about what happens in the brain when we have these profound states of altered consciousness. But when we actually get into the experience itself, uh, you know, can science really tell us of the symbolism that we experience, of the characters and, and the, you know, you say this is the realm of the artists and I, this is the realm of myth. You know, if you look at Buddhism or, or Hinduism and even Christianity, you see that all these characters and, and all these stories are actually dramatizations of our own psychological processes, Totally. you know, and, and, and that they're actually just maps, maps of our consciousness. And that's where like science, it, it can tell us, you know, what's happening in the body, but then it gets to this point where we just kind of have to pop into the mythological and archetypal realm to really understand what's happening, mm. you know? And mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's the leap from, from science to, Ooh, we need to start approaching this from a, a theological perspective, you know, it's yeah. inevitable. Right. Well, you know, it's a really interesting area, the psychology of religion, you know, mm. and uh, Harvard has been uh, on that for some time, yeah. you know, really with William James and uh, they had a um, fellow named Walter Houston Clark uh, who wrote a book called Chemical Ecstasy mm. and he was an associate of Timothy Leary and stuff, but he was in the divinity school. And he was part of the Good Friday experiment and stuff like that. And a uh, really uh, interesting character also wrote a book on the psychology of uh, religion. And so uh, this area of the similarities uh, and what does religion speak to the soul about, you know, mm -hmm. uh, transpersonal psychology has uh, been a very interesting field to open up uh, with Stan Groff and of course it's very congruent with uh, psychedelic uh, science and psychology and things like that people who've been trying to make a map of these very yeah. illogical but uh, uh, mythic kinds of psychedelic dimensions so yeah. not only do we have a kind of science of uh, mysticism in, in some ways you know that this if we do this, a mystical experience will happen. We're not saying much about the mystical experience, but it, we, you need one yeah. in order to, to, to heal. <laughs> yeah. And I think in psychology, the, uh, the tradition of psychoanalysis uh, and dream interpretation, you know, mm -hmm. I think the, the work that has been done on dream interpretation is so valuable when you pivot to the psychedelic experience mm -hmm. because, you know, it's, it's essentially the same thing. A, a psychedelic experience is, it's, it's a waking dream. You know, we talk about science as uh, something that might deny the soul, but when you look at psychology or even psychedelics, the word psyche in its original Greek root means soul. Right. So psychology is the study of the soul and psychedelics are what manifest the soul. Yeah. So this really is the science of the soul, <laughs> like technically yeah. speaking. <laughs> yeah. And, and why visually it's so interesting uh, to me because it cuts across uh, the uh, kind of belief systems mm -hmm. and gets to the archetypal realm. 
Jung was a lot uh, very interested in what were these cross-cultural archetypes and Campbell then helped to assemble uh, many of those things and so we yeah. can we can see now cross-culturally uh, how different archetypes you know have been important and they show up in different cultures and so you know as we're reimagining religion you know maybe we should study you know what has made those archetypes sturdy mm -hmm. and why they reappear yeah. and and what is it about the human psyche that needs uh, an affirmation uh, in mythology of that dimension yeah and and i think that 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 really brings up a good point in terms of the way we define true you know science might have something that they say is true but you know terence mckenna said how can i believe you you're changing your mind every 10 years <laughs> you know so well it's, like, it's updating it's, it's updating. usually updating and look science is meant to be provisional mm -hmm. this is the best approximation yeah. it's always hypothetical yeah it's this is hypothetically this is our best guess right now. Yeah, it's not true. It's just the least false thing we have. <laughs> to, the, and and our best way of understanding it as of now. Yeah. You yeah. know, uh, look, a new understanding of the universe could happen tomorrow. Yeah. If a if a UFO landed and, you know, like at Harvard or something and and uh, look, we've written it down here. It here's what we've basically been doing. You know, that would reformat everybody's hard drive about, oh, you mean really, you know? Yeah. And, um, okay. Uh, but then you'd have to question whether they were giving you a load or yeah, not. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and, you know, I think it's funny when you look at this from a Darwinian perspective, mm -hmm. an evolutionary perspective, you can go, okay, what is true? one definition of what's true is what lasts longest through time you know one of the things i say when someone says human beings are you know the superior animal on this earth well turtles the turtle has been around for 250 million years relatively unchanged in its shape humans have anatomically modern humans have been here for about 200,000 years so turtles have so much that that form that or that organism has so much more um experience with conflict with the natural world and ha has came out on top for so long so much longer than us that you know which which one is more true the turtle or the human and i kind of look at religious truths like this like if a religion Con confers a set of values to the population and believing and acting out those values is evolutionarily advantageous for those people across time doesn't isn't that doesn't it make those values true at least in some way if it's culturally affirming reverence for life mm -hmm. you know uh and then love it lasts. and love and it lasts then uh then you've found the magic you know that's something to build a culture around you know that's life culture not death culture mm -hmm. you know and uh so we want life culture we want everything that promotes life and we have to, means we have to rethink everything you know? yeah and, and so, we need to genuinely be pro-humanity. We have to love humanity and really be on the side of us thriving, you know? How do you do that? You have to find the sacredness. You have to see that humanity and affirm the sacredness of humanity. Yeah. Now, it's easy to kick ourselves, yeah. you know, uh, and especially when we start to realize, uh-oh, what we've done to the planet and uh, maybe ourselves and maybe others and whatnot, you know. Yeah. But uh, the the whole act of, uh, as, as many have said, to clean up your own act and to love yourself and to love the people that are around you is one of the uh, most important uh, acts. And it's a, uh, because it serves the reverence for life, you yeah. know, and that's a, evolutionary affirmation 
that can come through a religion or it doesn't need a religion to define it. Mm -hmm. It's simply that now we understand through the psychology of religion, in a sense, that this is one of the those things that, that humanity needs. And that's by, by that we evolve and I think unite both religion and science, you mm -hmm. know, really. It reminds me of something that I heard Douglas Rushkoff say, and he said, you know, he wrote a book called Team Human, which yeah. is a very pro-human text. Yeah. Uh, and one of the things he said was, the way we direct our evolution is to find out what's uniquely human and do more of that. So what do you think, what do you think are the most beautiful and endearing aspects of human beings mm -hmm. and that really makes you want makes you on team human art of course you know <laughs> it's like everything artful and musical and uh danceful and you know uplifting the uh the the beings who are inspired and ecstatic about life you know ecstasy is important you know to affirm one's reverence for life you know oh it's this good well damn you want to share that you know because it's so wonderful you know you love the world because it's such an awesome incredible place oh my god <laughs> every day is a is a spectacle that was created for our enjoyment you know mm -hmm. and so the uh the the loving you know is this of course i think of it as throughout the animal kingdom you can find love but as a as a unique human feature there's nothing better uh than that and as as albert hoffman another one who resolved science yeah. and mysticism in his life and said there was no problem there yeah. you know uh thought that love was the highest refinement uh as a chemist, you know, a yeah. refinement of sunlight. Mm. So in love is the uh, destiny, uh, ultimately, of all of us, because I think it's that unifying field that underlies all of us and is the place that the mystics live in that is the God that runs through all of us and is the infinite one that is present before our minds and before our bodies. I was thinking, like you were talking, that, you know, Dante's uh, Divine Comedy is a lot like this, that it's, it's like the shamanic journey, mm -hmm. you know, because of all the different worlds, of the lower worlds and the upper worlds, but the... Uh, the the sense of having traveled down to the depths and and up through purgatory in a sense, but before going to heaven, you had to drink of a river, the river Lethe, mm -hmm. you know, so to forget what you had experienced below, to forget the body and the mind, mm -hmm. to drop them in order to reach heaven. And so, and they, you know, different partners were leading him, you know, and so uh, that's that's the dimensions that are measurable, and then you have to let them go yeah. to experience the immeasurable, and then when you come back, the world is sacred, mm -hmm. and you you have reverence for life because you've seen the sacredness of everything, and uh, so. I don't know. I think we're at the time when we can recover that intuition. Yeah. And, you know, you spoke about love and being this a refinement of sunlight makes it seem like love is this kind of actual energy that exists in the universe. And I think what's really fascinating about your piece, The Universal Mind Lattice, is that you took this almost tradition of a observation and then scientific illustration to something that is very real but maybe just not yet measurable you mm. you kind of observed this and made a map right. and maybe that will actually you pushed out into the unknown and maybe some scientist will surf on your wake 
and find some way to find this field of love energy that we tap into. It's just not yet, uh, we just can't conceptualize that yet from where we are right now, but it doesn't mean it's not real. Right. Yeah. And, and as you were saying, I mean, um, in one of our previous conversations, you know, we were, we were imagining it's like, uh, well, there may be ways in the future to map our consciousness as we're having our visions, mm -hmm. you know, and wouldn't that be great? You know, you have immediate outload and output, you know, just of, press of, record. Of, exactly. Yeah. You know, it's like, wait a minute, it's getting good, man. You <laughs> know, and, and, uh, so, you know, uh, in in order to share that sacred space, I think that this is a time when uh, art is that bridge that is measuring the immeasurable mm -hmm. mystical experience. And uh, and thank you. You know, I I was a medical illustrator for a number of years and a scientific illustrator, I guess. Uh, but uh, my work has always been uh, depictive of uh, those, uh, of the mystical experience. And uh, I do believe that it is a kind of scientific illustration. You know, I am trying to be as accurate as I can on these dimensions I am trying to use the correct anatomy and uh, position of different things you know mm -hmm. because I think you want to honor uh, that dimension and it's part of reality and my intention is really to portray or to work with the subject of consciousness mm -hmm. and so how do you do that you know well we know we're conscious in our body so body is part of it so, so start with the body and that's why the sacred mirrors, uh, went like that. And then you have to contend with these other elements of consciousness, you know? And, uh, so that was a specific place where I tried to unite, uh, the insights of both science and religion, mm -hmm. you know, was, uh, the sacred mirrors. Yeah. One, you once said to me, biology is theology. Yeah. And that that's a really great kind of because we look at our, you know, some people will say we are these are just our meat vessels mm -hmm. that and there is this idea that we're just these like kind of flawed little meaty monkeys that like, you know, our our bodies will drop and then we'll become the soul that we really are. But that almost seems to denigrate the miracle that is the human right. body. The, there's yeah. no separation between body, mind, and spirit. Don't Our go body, hating it now. Don't go hating it. Yeah, yeah. it's God. It's God's gift. What are you? What? I made this whole thing, and now you're gonna put it down like that? Come on. Yeah. yeah. No, enjoy it and yeah. use it and and feel the beauty of life and and uh, oh yeah no. Look, uh, there are, uh, are always those polarities, mm -hmm. you know, oh, that's a little too much for me. It's a little not enough for me. So, but that's the, you know, that's why there's so much different art and that's, uh, and so many different kinds of sports, mm -hmm. you know, cause it, it feeds that hunger for seeing how far the body can go, yeah. you know? And, and, of, and of course the body was made through evolutionary processes and can you speak more to why you felt it felt compelled to make the frame of the sacred mirrors uh, a depiction of or at least a symbolic representation of the evolutionary process well because i feel that that's the ultimate framework to hold our individuality in and it's directly that, you know, it's the framework, you know, so, uh, and these are portrayals of the individual. And so within the context of cosmic evolution, because there's a flash on the bottom, and to me, that's the Big Bang, mm. you know, and 
then there's cosmic evolution. You've got little galactic clusters and things, and then they collect around, and there's the Earth and spinning out of the solar system and stuff. So I try to give a little bit of the you know, context that we find ourselves in, given the uh, context of evolution. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then the... Uh, expands from unicellular life forms all the way up and the different kinds of cranial vaults of the primates and the uh, upper you know homo sapiens and things that leading then to the technological evolution or more like you know, what were the creations that have been breakthrough in humanity's uh, history and so uh, having those be part of the context you know for holding the whatever truth you know i'm trying to put forward in the sacred mirrors uh became important on the top then there's the uh male and female and their unity in the center and around them are different life paths and wisdom paths um but this is all you know been raised you know through the gift of uh, evolution and the elders who are kind of seated on top of both those chains of uh, biological and, ev and technological evolution hold the hold it in their hands they hold mm -hmm. evolution itself in their hands and I hate to say it but here we are humanity that is basically holding the uh, development of life on earth in our hands yeah. and uh, and it and it is how we deal with it is our technological evolution that we've got our hands on as well and so that's that was the position I wanted to put mm. uh, people in and because uh, I think that we're in that time you know we got to recognize that our hands are on the wheel. Mm -hmm. Something else I wanted to touch on in terms of the kind of history of scientific revelation, many in, in the current of scientific materialism that denies the legitimacy of, say, spirit or even dreams. Uh, something I've learned recently was Rene Descartes, who laid down the foundation of the modern scientific method in 1619 while he was in his early 20s one night he had a dream where an angel appeared to him and the angel said to him the conquest of nature is to be achieved through measure and number and that dream and that contact with that angel is what led him into creating the scientific method, which then ultimately said that dreams aren't really in the realm of discussion. So, and, and of course, Socrates and the Greeks, who laid down essentially the, the foundation of Western thought, they had their daemons. They had aspects of their being that they communicated with through uh, to you know, either gather information or to analyze information. Mm -hmm. You know, their daemons, to some degree, were their bullshit radars. Right. <laughs> so, well, it, what they had, which was an advantage to the modern materialist, was a multi-dimensional framework of reality. You know, once you went through the Eleusinian mysteries, you were pretty well dosed. You know, and. Uh, into both a mythic framework, if you wanted to accept that, or simply the archetypal understanding that there is a visionary domain, there is an ideal domain, as uh, Socrates and Plato would re refer to it, and that these ideas, uh, in a sense, are um, other dimensional... Uh, relations that are being had with uh, the physical world mm -hmm. so this is where soul stuff is happening it's happening alongside of 
uh, the physical domain, but the daemon is not physically present for um, Aristotle, you know, who's like, come on, come on, you know, like, come along, Socrates, you know, but Socrates, uh, you know, go go ahead, I, I'm having a conversation with my daemon here, you yeah. know. And he was known to do that in the public square for, you know, some times, you know, to uh, argue with this being, this invisible being. So to have the advantage of being able to uh, have theurgy, which is, you know, mm. basically uh, contact with this other world, the other dimensions. A theologue, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Uh you know, I mean, Descartes was having theurgy. He was having contact from an angel. And uh, so that kind of uh, relationship being acknowledged as a, a kind of uh, normal uh, behavior and norm of consciousness and even of higher consciousness and developed consciousness. Mm -hmm. You see, right now, we try to haul those people off the street. If they're just standing in the public square talking to themselves yeah, or something like yeah. that, we're worried about them. You know, we don't regard them as Socrates uh, addressing his daemon. Yeah. You know, to have a context like that, to give them space, you know, to let them converse with their, as long as they're not being violent, yeah, you know, yeah. and, uh, and who knows, they may lead to a philosophical breakthrough. Something might come <laughs> out of that. Yeah. yeah. And I just think it's so, it's so, ironic and, and so funny that, you know, the scientific method was born of, of this kind of theurgy. Right. Well, um, the same, same thing with the birth of uh, psychology it comes yeah. out of ESP. It's not just yeah. out of uh, materialism and things like that. It yeah. comes out of a lot of investigation uh, at the end of the 19th century, you know, that, uh, you know, how can we understand ourselves and the yeah. mind, you know, in a scientific way. Yeah. You know, uh, how can we put the yardsticks of science into our intangible inner realms? And even chemistry came from alchemy. Mm -hmm. And alchemy really is a quasi-religious pursuit. Yes. You know, it's this, it's this idea of the philosopher's stone right. and the refinement stages that all things go through and these meta-governing principles that might allow us not to just become higher refined versions of ourselves, but maybe even refined lead into gold. Yes. You know, alchemy really is the dream that science was born out of. Of course. And that uh, dream of transmutation, mm. which literally was happening in some of their flasks and things of the alchemists. Uh, for Paracelsus, you know, it was uh, the alchemist who has credited, I guess, with uh, some of the invention of chemistry and things like mm -hmm. that in the town of Basel, Switzerland and everything. What do you uh, know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, so like 500 years before Paracelsus in Basel, Switzerland, grinding up his chemicals and everything was his supposed conclusion was that something else was to be discovered before the philosopher's stone could mm. be discovered. And uh, that so... What he was going to do was basically categorize better and take some of the uh, imagination out of these chemical um, kind mm. of uh, interactions mm -hmm. and things like that and simply describe what's happening out in the world, not what's happening in the soul of the chemist, you know. And so, so the uh, this kind of idealist analog, uh, uh, spiritual alongside of the chemical yeah. uh, was lost. You know, the imagination link uh, to the chemical reaction is lost. To become more objective. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And so, uh, but what does LSD do but bring the imagine full scale roaring back into the objective. chemical. Exactly. Yeah. You know, into the chemical. In Basel, Switzerland. <laughs> yeah. So, I think Paracelsus was right. Yeah. Something was needed to be discovered, and it was a chemist who discovered it. And uh, that is a, a form of angel's tears, in a, in a way, you know, that came through uh, Albert that day and has led to the 
revolution in psychedelic science that we have today and questions of the uh you know the balance of science and religion yeah i i think psychedelics uh really are one of the strongest ways where we can kind of rescue the idea of the soul in otherwise materialist science absolutely Um, and well thank you so much through trying to make this bridge between these two things in your art um i think i think it's a great lighthouse that it kind of illuminates how we can integrate these things moving forward without completely discrediting one or the other bringing them together art's a safe realm to uh bat the ideas around in actually you know and uh and it, it it's always attempted to affirm the sacred you know and that's what we have to do, reverence life, you know. So if we can embed that in our work, you know, maybe that's serving that message too. Yeah. I think that's a good place to wrap it up. Great. Alex Gray, thank you so much. Thank you, Tyler. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of the Cosm Podcast. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on future offerings. Check out shop.cosm.org for limited edition fine art prints, apparel, and other gifts. All proceeds support the opening of Entheon, Sanctuary of Visionary Art. See you next time.